hold on to your hats, dudes. We are in for a ride on a roller coaster because, yes, we are going to create the graphs of polynomials. And the graphs of polynomials usually turn out to be what would be a great roller coaster ride. So you're asking why are the graphs of polynomials going to make a great roller coaster ride? Well, that's because they have several characteristics, but the most important is that they must have smooth, continuous curves. Okay. Now, I know you understand what smooth is, but we'll be a little more specific here. What they cannot have, you can have no sharp points, no holes, no asymptotes. They have to be smooth and they cannot have any breaks in them. Continuous means, con continuous is actually a calculus concept that we get pretty excited about in calculus, but con continuity or a continuous function is smooth and unbroken. It has no gaps or holes in it anywhere. Okay. When I see the graph of a polynomial, it's what I think a graph should look like. This Nice little roller coaster ride. Okay, but unfortunately, graphing polynomials can be quite a handful. And to graph it perfectly exact is virtually impossible, unless, of course, you use a graphing calculator or you use calculus techniques. We're going to try to be learning the basic characteristics of a polynomial, and in the end, you're hoping to get a rough general sketch of this polynomial. We will not be plotting it at all accurately it will be a rough sketch. So key characteristics you need to be able to find on a polynomial. You have to be able to determine the number of relative maximums and minimums. Now this book calls them local maximums and minimums. Another term for it, how many peaks and valleys. Ooh, that's a bad color. Let's try something a little more visible than that. So when you're looking for the number of relative maximums and minimums, you have to be able to count the number of peaks and valleys. I'm going to put up here a basic polynomial. And if we were to count the peaks and valleys, there'd be one, two, three, four. Okay, and some of you may be remembering that uh, a polynomial's equation is, of course, going to be something with a number of terms to it. You've been solving them in the last few days. Okay. This is a possible equation for this particular polynomial. Nothing exact here. But you may notice what's the highest power of this polynomial, called the degree of the polynomial. Okay, well this is a degree five polynomial, and you'll notice how many peaks and valleys does it have? Yes, we counted it, it's got four. So when you're counting the peaks and valleys, it will be the degree minus one. And what I should say, that's the maximum number of relative maximums and minimums it could have. That is not a guarantee that you will have that many, but that's simply a maximum number possible that could occur. So you're could, you can definitely have a fifth degree polynomial and have less peaks and valleys. Very possible. Okay, the number of x-intercepts. Also, what they're going to call the zeros. Actually, I probably should have written it that way. Let's put it in there that way because that's the way they're going to refer to it in your instructions. That's the zeros, but yes, it's the same thing as the x-intercepts, the solutions, many other terms. So the number of zeros you're going to have there, once again, we've already been studying this. When you were solving your polynomials, how did you know how many answers you could get? Well, yes, whatever the degree of the polynomial is. So if you had a fifth degree polynomial, then you could have five zeros. If you had a tenth degree polynomial, you could have ten zeros. Now, 
There are always 10 solutions, but sometimes they are imaginary, so therefore they're not always zeros of the function. There's a difference. Okay. You may remember from previous years we talked about the end behavior. This particular polynomial is x to the fifth. That's an odd degree polynomial. What do you notice about what the ends are doing? Yes, the ends are going in opposite directions. The left end is going downward. The right end is going upward. So if you have an odd degree, your ends are going to be going in opposite directions. I was supposed to be, didn't spell well there. Let's try that again. If you have an even degree polynomial, then you're going to have both ends going the same direction. Now, what I have just listed here is what I would con is considered normal. A normal odd degree polynomial should have the left end down and the right end up. A normal even degree polynomial should have both ends going up. However, we know that those can flip. Like we can have them going opposite directions. And that's based on the leading coefficient. The leading coefficient is the coefficient on the highest power term. Okay, and it deter determines then whether it's positive or negative is going to have the impact. If your leading coefficient is positive, it's going to be like I had it up here. We're going to have, this is with a positive leading coefficient. If you have a negative leading coefficient, then those are going to reverse. Your left end's going to be up, your right end's going to be down or you're going to have two downs when the leading coefficient is negative. Okay, those are all things you've seen before we talked about them. Now two we talked about in pre-calc, so those should not be a great big surprise to you. Okay, topic we really haven't discussed a whole lot but which this book gets really excited about is what's called the multiplicity of the zeros. Okay, the multiplicity is how many times that zero happened. So if you solved this equation, say you did the synthetic division thing and you solved this equation, and say you got an answer of two twice, that would be a multiplicity of two. If you solved it and negative 1 was a solution three times, then that's a multiplicity of negative of 3. Negative 1 occurred three times. So multiplicities are the number of times a certain zero occurred. And they're actually visible when you look at the graph. The zeros are, of course, where the graph hits the x-axis. So we know that if it crosses through the x-axis, it has what's called an odd multiplicity, meaning that zero happened one time, three times, or five times. If it, cro if it comes down, hits the x-axis, and turns around and goes back, in other words, bounces off the x-axis, then it has an even multiplicity. Now, this example graph I have over here will make this a little more clear. Part of this, you, um, you may be going, what? You're going to have to believe me because I don't have time to take you through the extreme details. If you really want to know, try graphing a few of these on your calculator and you'll get a look for it. Okay, if you look at this particular problem, and let me throw some coordinates out here so we can all tell what we're talking about. Okay, we will notice that this graph crosses at negative 5, crosses through the x-axis. That means negative 5 is one of the zeros, and because it goes through, it has an odd multiplicity, meaning negative 5 was a solution once, three times, or five times. 
Okay, what is interesting is there's a way to tell whether the multiplicity might be greater. You'll notice this at negative 5, it comes through there fairly at a fairly sharp angle. So that is probably a multiplicity of 1. Okay, at negative 3, you'll notice the graph, graph comes up, hits the x-axis, and goes back down. In other words, bouncing off the x-axis. Okay, whenever that occurs, that means there's a multi an even multiplicity. So since that bounced off at negative 3, negative 3 had to occur at least twice. Could be 4 times, 6 times, or 8 times. But notice, it turned around fairly sharply and went back down again. It's easier to see on these next two. At 0, it crosses through the x-axis. So that means it's got an odd multiplicity. It, zero was an answer one, three, five, seven, or nine times. But notice how the graph kind of flattens out as it comes through that point. It's not going through sharp at a sharp angle, but it's kind of at a flat curve there. That's a big indicator. So more than likely, this one had zero was not an answer once, but zero was potentially an answer three times. It had to be an odd amount if it crossed through the axis. Okay, so what do you notice about what's happening over there at positive 4? Well, it bounces off the axis, so it's got to be an even multiplicity. 4 had to happen at least twice. The question is, do we think it happened more times than that? Well, if you notice once again, it's a much flatter curve right there at 4, and when it's flatter, that means the multiplicity is higher. So there's a very good chance that this one has a multiplicity of at least 4 could be higher, 6 or 8. If that's the case then, how many actual zeros do I have in this thing? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay, do I know this graph is odd or even? An even odd degree or even degree. And I know both ends are going up, so it's an even degree, so that makes sense. So this, this particular graph probably has an equation that's a tenth degree. It's got x to the tenth in it. Now, um, while the multiplicities are interesting, they do create some problems. So we're going to go see if you got the handle on this a little bit. I have some graphs drawn here, and I want you to um, estimate for me the degree of this polynomial and tell me whether the leading coefficient is positive or negative. Okay, so degree. Several ways to check it. One, we can look at the number of peaks and valleys. We notice it has one, two peaks and valleys. And we learned back here that the peaks and valleys are the relative maximums and minimums. It was one less than the degree. So since there's two here, we go up one, the degree has to be at least three from that perspective. We could also check the zeros and the multiplicities, we see it crosses through here once, has to be an odd multiplicity, it's going through pretty sharply, didn't flatten out there, so probably is just once. But we notice over here that this one flattened out more, so that would indicate possibly a multiplicity of two, it has to be even because it bounced off, so if there's one there and two there, that looks in several ways like we have a degree of 3, more than likely, in this particular polynomial. Now, is the leading coefficient positive or negative? That's strictly based on the end behavior. Which way are your ends going? Left end is down, right end is up. I think of that as normal. The negative side should be negative. It should go down. The positive side should be positive. It should go up. So this is a normal leading coefficient. Okay, if we look at the next one. We want the degree and the leading coefficient. If we count just the zeros, well, we have a zero here, and we have a zero over here. Those are both cutting through very sharply. That me leads me to think there's only a multiplicity of one there. But there's no way this is just a degree two polynomial. Degree two polynomials are parabolas. And you'll notice, though, there are many more peaks and valleys. So when something like this occurs, 
you may not use the zeros may not be your best option for figuring it out. Perhaps we need to look at all the relative maximums and minimums, which we have one, two, three, four, and five. Since we have five, and we know that the degree has to be at least one more than that, that would indicate it should go up to at least a six, which would make pretty good sense here. And then what is our leading coefficient, positive or negative? Well, both ends are going down. So that tells us the leading coefficient has to be negative. So sometimes these, the zeros and the multiplicities are your best way to tell. Sometimes the relative maximum minimums, the peaks and valleys are your best way to tell. Depends on what a given graph is doing. Okay, looking at number three here, um, we may perhaps want to consider both options here and see which one gives us both or if they maybe back each other up. Okay, if I go count peaks and valleys, one, two, three, just three. That would indicate it has to be a degree of four for sure. Okay, so we know it has to be at least four, but let's also check the zeros and the multiplicities. If I check the zeros, this one's coming through fairly sharply, so I would say that counts as one. This is a bounce off the x-axis, pretty sharp bounce off the x-axis, but that says it has to be even, so there has to be at least two times that particular zero happened at least twice. And then when we get over here to where this nice little bend occurs, it's crossing through, so it has to be an odd multiplicity. But since it flattened out, that indicates it's more than just one. And odd, the next number after one would be three, so we're going to guess three. So adding that up, three two plus two plus one, that tells me it's got to be more likely, it's got to be at least a degree six polynomial. And if I look at the leading coefficient, both ends are going up, so it's got to be a positive leading coefficient. Well, are we having fun yet? Polynomials are a bit of a challenge. Okay, they're then going to give you some equations. They're going to give you the equation of the polynomial and have you describe what's the degree, the end behavior, and one of the other key things we have to find on any graph when we go to sketch these is the y-intercept, too. We want to know where it crosses the y-axis. So, the degree, pretty simple here. Got highest power is 4, so this is a degree 4 polynomial. As far as the end behavior, they want to know is it going to be an up, down, an up, up, a down, up. What's going to happen? Well, it's an x to the fourth, so that's even, which means both ends are going up. It's positive, so it's going to stay up. So, yes, this is going to be an up, up. And then y intercepts. Well, let's think about that a second. You got this crazy polynomial. But what do you know about the y-axis coordinate? Anytime a graph hits the y-axis, you know one of the coordinates. You know that that coordinate has to be when x is 0. So anytime we want a y-intercept, you simply have to put 0 in for x and figure it out. Well, if I put 0 in for all those x's, what's going to be left? Negative 12, so yes, my y-intercept must be the coordinate 0, negative 12. So finding y-intercepts is really simple. Just put 0 in for x and you got your y-intercept. Okay, on the second one, they didn't give it to you in the form where it was in standard form where it's all multiplied out. They've given it to you in factored form. And, in fact, you can see the multiplicities. x plus 4 is happening three times, so that's a multiplicity of 3. x minus 1 is happening twice. So when you go, want to go figure out the degree, well, you're still having to figure out what would the degree of all these x's be if I did multiply this together. Well, if I did multiply this together, x squared plus 3, that's a degree of 2. This x plus 4, even if I cube that quantity out, I'm going to get an x cubed. In fact, maybe I should write it this way. I'm going to have an x squared. That's going to result in an x cubed. And this last one's going to result in an x squared for sure. So if I take all of those together, that's going to give me x to the seventh. So this must be a seventh degree polynomial. Okay. Consequently, then, once you figure that out, end behavior, and oh, I should have put some pizzazz in this. Well, I'm going to add one more thing to that. Suppose there's a negative out in front of this whole mess. 
Okay? End behavior. It's the seventh degree. It's odd. So the ends are going in opposite directions. But because I chose to put a negative on that, that negative means that the leading coefficient is going to be negative. So if the leading coefficient is going to be negative, that means it's going to switch. Normal is for left end to go down, right to go up. So since this one's got a negative on it, it's going to flip, and it's going to be an up, down, left end up, right end down. Okay, last but not least, how do I get the y-intercept? Remember we said the y-intercept is where x equals 0. So you're going to sub 0 in for all of these x's, which if I do that, 0 squared plus 3 is going to be 3. 0 plus 4 is going to be 4, but it's cubed. And 0 minus 1 is going to be negative 1, but it's squared. So that's actually going to give me negative 3 times 64 times 1, or a grand total of negative 192. So therefore, my y-intercept is the coordinate 0, negative 192. And yes, polynomials can have coordinates like that, because when polynomials have those powers on them, the numbers can be quite large. All right, now we're ready to go in reverse here again. They've got you looking at a graph this time, and I'm trying to mirror the types of problems you have on your assignment today, in case you've noticed, wondering. So now, once again, not only do they want us to find the degree as we were doing before, but they want us to find the degree, the zeros, n come up with a possible equation for this polynomial, and state its domain and range. Boy, howdy, doesn't that sound like fun? So here we go with the degree. We need to use both pieces of information. We need to use the peaks and valleys, and we also need to use the zeros to help us. So if we check peaks and valleys, the easy one, one, two, three, four. So peaks and valleys is four, which means it has to be at least a degree five. But if we check zeros and multiplicities, we may not agree with that so easily. And so this out here at, that should be negative 3, not positive 3. Out here at negative 3, it's crossing through sharply. So we are going to count that as 1. At negative 1, it's also passing through sharply. So we're going to say that's 1. Maybe I should circle those. Okay, at 2, we're bouncing off the x-axis. Do you think we're bouncing sharply? Are we going flat? Looks pretty sharp there, so we're going to say that's also just 1. And then over here at positive 6, that's getting flatter and bending there. It's crossing through, so is it odd or even? This is a cross through. It's an odd multiplicity. That means it's got to be happening three times, at least. Could be more than that. So if we add all those up, we have 3. Oh, sorry. Duh. You're all probably screaming at me. I said that was a multiplicity. It had to be a 2. Sorry. Since it bounced off, it had to be even. So there, let's try that again. 3 plus 2 is 5, 6, 7. So that gets us a 7th degree. Does our end behavior indicate, Kate, that it should be odd? Yes, it does. Our end behavior indicates it's got to be an odd degree. So we're good there. Okay, it wants you to list the zeros, which we just named them. They were at negative 3, negative 1, 2, and 6. And then here comes the fun part. They wanted you to come up with an equation for this thing. Fortunately, they're willing to let you come up with the equation in factored form. So if negative 3 was a 0, what factor did it come out of? Well, from doing your synthetic division problems, you should know it came out of the factor x plus 3. We would have x plus 1, we would have x minus 2, and x minus 6. Now, you have to go back, though, and put the multiplicities on them. x minus 2 could have happened three times, or excuse me, x minus 6. I'm going backward from right to left. The x minus 2 was squared, and the other two were first powers. Let me draw a line here and separate this so we don't get confused. 
So now, does that all jive? Would that create a degree of 7? You should be able to add up the powers on the x's and get 7, which we would. Does it also get us the right end behavior? Left end going up, right end going down. Well, we have, ours is going to be positive. All those x's are positive. So we have left end going down, right end going up. We need to make this thing flip. So yes, we would also have to throw a negative on it as a possibility there to make the leading coefficient come out correctly. Okay. Last but not least then, they want you to name the domain and the range. Domain and range of polynomials is really easy. Because the domain of a polynomial it's a smooth, continuous curve. If it's continuous and unbroken, that means you're using e every single x on the whole coordinate system. So the domain on a polynomial is always negative infinity to positive infinity, without doubt. Okay, the range is either one of two things. The range is either also negative infinity to positive infinity. And remember, you're thinking y coordinates here. You're thinking y coordinates low to high. So it's either going to be negative infinity to positive infinity, or if both ends are going the same direction, it may be 4 to infinity. It might be negative infinity up to 3, but relatively simple. In this case, how low is this one going? Well, it's going downward forever, and it's going upward forever. So this one's range is going to end up being negative infinity to positive infinity also. Um, to give you a quick example here, if you had one that went woo, and both ends were going down and say this high point occurred at 6. Your range then is everything below 6. So for this one, the range would be negative infinity to 6. Be sure you put a bracket on that because it would include the 6. All right. Now for the big, big piece here. They want you to actually attempt to sketch a polynomial's graph. Now, notice, sketch, not plot exactly, sketch. It means you get a ballpark guess of what this graph looks like. You are not getting a perfect graph. Okay, there are what are called guidelines for sketchy polynomials in your book. When you read the instructions to these problems, it's going to say, use the guidelines for sketching polynomials on page such and such. Okay, I have listed those four guidelines here. When you look at a polynomial, you need to determine the end behavior, figure out what's going to happen. You need to find the y-intercept and the zeros. And then plot all those things, consider the multiplicities, and possibly when it says mid-interval points, that means you might have to plot a couple other points to get an idea where the graph is at. And you come up with a rough sketch of this. Now, it's not going to make sense until we actually try to do one. I'm just going to have to talk you through it. So you will need graph paper here. We're going to try to get rough sketch only. So taking you through those steps that were just listed on the page before, it said, first of all, figure out the degree of the polynomial. Well, this particular one ha is a fourth degree polynomial. It's even. And so what are the, what's the end behavior going to do? Actually, yeah, sorry, that was supposed to be end behavior. Since it's fourth degree end behavior, the leading coefficient is positive, so it's going to have both ends going up. Okay, that's the first thing it wants to know. Then it suggested you would want to find out where the y intercept is at. How do we find a y intercept? We sub zero in for x. So if I put 0 in this function, of course, every, all those x's turn to 0, and I get 8. So I have a y-intercept at 0, 8. I'm going to go ahead and put that on the graph. I know I have a y-intercept at 0, 8. Okay, and then the biggie. I have to find the zeros of this graph. I actually have to know where this thing equals 0, meaning I have to solve this equation. And yes, if realization is hitting you out there, I'm hearing many groans. How on earth am I going to solve this thing and figure out where it equals zero? This one isn't going to factor. Yes, it's everybody's favorite. We are going to do the synthetic division and solve these babies. Woo! 
Yes, so in the middle of your graphing problem, you're also going to have to do the synthetic division stuff. Boy, howdy, couldn't be more fun, huh? So we need to find a number that makes it equal zero. I am going to take pity on you and tell you that I have already set and tested numbers and discovered that negative one happens to conveniently be a number that makes this thing equal zero. So we're going to use negative one. We're going to write down our coefficients and we're going to notice that all of them are present. We don't have to leave any zeros in the placeholders. We're going to add down and get a one times by the box and get negative one, negative five, five, two, negative two, eight, negative eight, and zero. So hey, we know we're right. So therefore we know we have from negative one, we have the factor x plus one. And now we have the factors going one less power, x cubed minus 5x squared plus 2x plus 8. So the question is, do we think we can now solve that four-term expression without having to do more algebra here? And if you think about grouping on that one, do you think we're going to get grouping to work? And unfortunately, we're not. <laughs> so. We're going to have to do synthetic division again. And I'm going to conveniently tell you that, oops, sorry about that. I found that the number negative 1 works again. Ha ha! So that also means we have a multiplicity. Isn't that exciting? So we're going to put negative 1 in the box. We're going to write down these coefficients, which are the exact coefficients we finished the last synthetic division with, if you notice. We're going to drop the 1, times it by the box, adds negative 6, times it by the box, gives me 8, times it by the box, gives me negative 8, and of course, the 0 I wanted. So now, what factors do I have? Remember, I had an x plus 1 already. This negative 1 makes another, so now I have two of them. I have a multiplicity. And then I have x squared minus 6x plus 8. Well, hot dog, we're down to a trinomial. And look at that. I think this baby would factor. I believe if we did minus 2 and minus 4, we could get this thing to work. So now we know that our zeros will be negative 1, 2, and 4 when we solve it. But we know negative 1 is a multiplicity of 2. That's very important. Now I'm going to scroll back up here and put this up here where I can actually get it to fit in. So we had negative 1, 2, and 4. But I am going to note that that was a multiplicity of 2 for that negative 1 because that's going to affect how we graph it. We know it's going to bounce off the axis at that point. I'm also going to go put those points on the graph, negative 1, 2, and 4. I know I have to bounce off the graph. Okay, um, was there anything else on those guidelines we were supposed to do? It said determine the end behavior, we did it. Find the y-intercepts, we did it. Find the zeros, we did it. Now, use all that information and possibly plot a few other points if you need to. Try to sketch this graph. So I guess we're ready to attempt to sketch. I'm going to put my end behavior on there. My ends were both supposed to go up. And I know that at negative 1 here, I had a multiplicity at 2. So is that going to work? I need both ends to go up at some point. I know I have to have a multiplicity there, which means what's going to happen when that graph hits the x-axis? Yes, it's going to bounce. So I know this graph has to be coming down to this point. Now here's the thing about why we call this a sketch. I know it's got to come down here and come back up. It could do that. It could be out here doing this. We have no idea exactly where that graph is going to be plotted. Since we're sketching, you aren't required to find out. If you really want to, you could plot another point to the left. You could plot negative 4 or negative 10 just to get a value. But you actually don't have to. You're just looking for a bare rough sketch here. So I'm just going to do something in the middle ground say, OK, this baby turn around, hit this. Now, 
Look how fast it's got to get up there to the y-intercept. It's got to go up. Now, here's the question. Because that's the y-intercept, does that mean the graph turns around right there? It could. That might be a peak or valley. It may not. We don't know for sure. You can turn it around there if you want, but you shouldn't assume that the y-intercept is just always is going to be a relative maximum or minimum here. You can't make that assumption. I would probably, in this case, because there's a nice and easy number to test, since that's a zero, I could also test positive one pretty quickly in this function. So if I would, was to put one in this function, you could sub it into your calculator. I would get 1 minus 4 minus 3 plus 10 plus 8. It's pretty easy to sub all 1 in. And that's going to give me 12. So I know that this particular function hits higher. It's, I can't quite get to 12, but it'd be right up here toward the top. So I know that this graph, is it, as it's coming up, this graph is not, that y-intercept is not going to be my actual relative maximum, this graph is actually going on higher, turning around, well, whoops, sorry, I'm off a box, it should be over here, it's going to turn around, and then, boom, it's got to be back down here. Now, since this was only a multiplicity of one, it's got to go shooting through there. I know it's not going to bounce, but I have a problem. Somehow here, it's got to turn around again, because I've got to cross through one more zero. And I have absolutely no idea where it might turn around. I know this point is at two. I know that point is at six. So pick something in the middle. It's kind of your choice on that one, probably three or four. I happened to pick three and throw three in there. You could once again throw this in a calculator. I threw it in a brain. Got 81 minus 108 minus 27 plus 30 plus 8. And that came out to be negative 16. So negative 16 would also, at 3, negative 16. I probably should have plotted 4, shouldn't I? Oh, well. Negative 16 is down there somewhere. The point is, this graph goes down, turns around, comes by a gap. Now, does it bounce or shoot through? It was an odd multiplicity. And plus, the ends have to be going up, so I know it goes up from there. Now, there's no way that that graph is remotely accurate to the exact graph, but it is an approximate sketch. And if you're going, but I can go to my calculator and get an exact graph, I'm with you, dudes. I'm teaching this for one reason. I have never taught this before, because there is a question like this on your semester final. So you might put a big star by this one in your notes, because they do make you draw a sketch of a polynomial on the final. Sad but true. The one other thing you could also do that I'm probably not going to scream about that would make it things a little bit faster, if you would um, actually, in your calculator, whoops, sorry, I'm moving that. I wanted to make it bigger. There we go. If you would, in your calculator, if you go to a graph, And you put in this function, if you type in the function in F1, then you can go to table and you can easily get these other values that you need. And you could actually plot values quite nicely from there. So that's a faster way to sub values into this function. Or you can use, you can also sub values into the function by simply writing out the function, doing the line, and x equals a number. But unfortunately, yes, they're going to expect you to be able to sketch a polynomial. This goes against my grain as a modern teacher. I'm sorry with today's technology. No one's going to roughly sketch a polynomial anymore. They're going to go to the graphing calculator. Or the best way, if you want to hand sketch it, is you use calculus techniques. Because with calculus, we can locate the important points on this graph lickety split and draw a rough sketch very quickly much more efficiently than this. So I'm sorry to torture you with this, but I don't get to pick. So last but not least, um, when the very end problems, you've done this before. You've got a couple problems at the end of this assignment that want you to do cubic and quartic regression.
okay? What would be the difference between cubic and quartic? You're going to sketch, put a scatter plot on your graph, and you might get a scatter plot that does something like this. Okay, what kind of a function might fit something like that? Well, both ends are going up. It's got one, two, three peaks and valleys, so it could be x to four. So that might very well be modeled by a quartic. So if you actually have done a scatter plot and you have data that's bouncing around and curving, cubics and quartics will attempt to fit polynomials to it. Okay, just as a, ri a reminder, what you need to do to do regressions, I'm assuming you remember most of it, but you will have to go to a new document and create a spreadsheet. You're going to have to name your lists. So maybe it's year and who knows, cost of something. And you're going to enter your data in your spreadsheet. Okay, how do you get the scatter plot on screen? You're going to add a data and statistics page. And you're going to go select the x and y axis, and you're going to choose the names, year and cost, and label your axes, and your scatter plot's going to appear. But if you recall, you can't do anything but look at this pretty scatter plot. You can, you can show the cubic or quartic regression on there, and it will actually show you what it looks like, and you certainly need to do that to see how well it fits. But unfortunately, you can't do anything else but look at it. So then you'll have to go back to your spreadsheet and you will have to run the regression again. That way then it will put all that information over on the right hand side of your screen. It'll show you the correlation, it'll show you the equation, all that good stuff. And remember that's under menu statistics. one variable, not one variable stats, menu stats, and then you just choose the regression you want. Sorry. So you can get that information. And then you can look up answers either in the table or by going and creating a graph page and doing intersect. So by now you should be masters of regressions. That's the thrills and excitement with polynomials. I'm sure you've had a wonderful time and you're looking forward to this assignment with extreme excitement. Good luck. By the way, next time is review day and then a test.